So this is our agenda for today. We'll talk about some housekeeping items here. Uh, we will um, have a discussion about uh, how you can get your policy and practice questions answered. We will then uh, walk you through the close down steps and talk about what you need to do to prepare for submitting your information and data uh, to the reporting systems. Um, we'll talk about reports and the requirements associated with that, how you access those reports in the system. We'll talk about some of the supports available to you, and then we'll uh, go through the timeline uh, for the ELA uh, program, and then um, have an opportunity to hopefully answer a few questions, uh, and then we'll wrap up for today. As I mentioned, if there are policy questions or questions about practice, you can get those questions answered by sending an email directly to the email you see on the screen. That's elahelp at education.ohio.gov. And someone from the department will respond to your question. So let's um, talk a little bit about the closed down steps. I'm gonna share just a few things with you relative to that. And to, again, provide you with some things that as a data manager, you should be considering, you should be implementing and doing um, at this portion in the assessment window. So it's important to understand that the uh, information needs to be entered by 1159 on November 14th. So all student assessment data must be entered by that time on that date. There will be an opportunity for you as a data manager to do some data cleanup. Um, that's going to be related to, you know, the student files and things of that nature. We'll give you some time to do that. Uh, we'll conclude at 11.59 p.m. on the 23rd. But prior to that, we want you communicating with your schools to make sure that they're doing their part to clean up the data related to student file, teacher information, and enrollment information as necessary. Certainly, as data managers, uh, we want you going into the system and improving any transfer requests um, that may have come through, um, and then to follow up on those that you've sent out as well. And certainly, uh, we want to emphasize here that all data managers should download um, any and all desired reports from the system in order to create your archive. The way the system works is it basically tracks the activity that is going on in the system. In order to provide access to a report, if you will, of what has gone on in the system, um, there needs to be activity. And so that activity um, is related to you as a data manager actually downloading the reports that you need. And when you do that, an archive of that um, activity is created. If you don't download a particular specific report, there's no activity recorded, there's no tracking of that, and as a result, there's no archive, meaning that as a data manager, you won't be able to go back to look at previous reports. So we're encouraging all data managers to do that. You can even do that today to kind of trigger that process um, so that you are able to then go back in time if you need to, to access those reports from um, this fall window. So let's talk a little bit about what you would need to do as you're preparing for your submission, for submitting your data, your student information to uh, EMIS or to EAS. So one of the things, and this is really relative to the K-Ready system, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, those that are using the bridge form here uh, in just a moment. But for those using the K-Ready system, we would uh, encourage you to access that system and download, again, any available reports in order to address the following. So to go in and check your transfers, make sure that there are no pending transfers on your end or that you're not waiting for approval from another district for transfers. Make sure that you have student scores and data for all the students. And then again, making sure that the teacher status is correct in the system. So if the teacher is no longer in the system, that that status has been set to inactive and that if they are in the system, that they are set as active. Likewise, that the enrollments are correct, that the student and teacher linkages are correct, that the current data collection um, is being used. So you have multiple data collections for ELA. You have a fall collection, you'll have a winter collection and a spring collection. We are uh, encouraging you to check to make sure that those enrollments are tied and linked to the correct data collection which is listed here on the screen. That's 1ELA Fall 21. That's the correct data collection for this fall window. 
And then also to make sure that the point of authority or POA is correct, that you have the point of authority for the students that um, you're responsible for in your system. For those of you that are using the bridge form, we'd like to encourage you to communicate with your schools um, through your local communication methods. So whether that's an uh, email or whether you have set up, um, say for instance, a Zoom meeting to, to walk your teachers and administrators through this process, whatever it is that you typically do or need to do in order to ensure that the data on the bridge form is accurate prior to reporting student data in EMIS or EAS. This is very, very important. Um, unlike the K-Ready system, you're not able to see if all student scores have been entered. You're not able to see if um, the teachers have um, completed uh, the form uh, correctly. So we encourage you to, as soon as possible, communicate with your teachers so that you can get um, a status on where they are in this process, answer any kind of questions that they may have, and certainly ensure that this form is completed and filled out correctly prior to it coming to you. Uh, we want you to please note that while we have continued to support the bridge form, we are strongly encouraging all locations to use the K-Ready system for reporting ELA student scores and data. Uh, again, there, there are a great many benefits to using um, the K-Ready system. And uh, as I just mentioned, being able to go into the system to see where your teachers are, just the status um, portion of that is a huge benefit uh, as it is. You're unable to do that in the bridge form. So we are uh, strongly encouraging all locations to use the K-Ready system for reporting um, ELA assessment data. So then back to the K-Ready system, when we are using the K-Ready system uh, for a close down, all of these areas and um, will, will be used. And so we will walk you through this, certainly as we talk um, through the various aspects of close down. One of the pieces that we're going to discuss now is related to transfers. Talk just a little bit about um, the differences in the transfers and what you need to do as a data manager specific to transfers. One of the uh, important things to remember is that there are two types of transfers, internal and external. Obviously, internal would be transfers within the same district. Those occur between two buildings in the same district. Um, and so the process for internal transfers are, are a little bit different. Uh, you would just simply upload the new student ID and enrollment file, meaning connecting that student to um, the new teacher. And then that student would then be removed from the original teacher. So the other um, um, teacher that's uh, currently connected to that student would need to be removed. Internal transfers do not appear in the K-Ready system, K-Ready system's transaction history. So please note that that transfer would only show up um, in your records based upon, um, uh, again, making that teacher correction in your enrollment files. It's not going to show up in the transfer history. The other type of transfer is the external transfer. That is when a student is loaded uh, from a different um, district with the same student ID, that's going to trigger um, a request to the previous district. That's going to send a message out to the data manager of the previous district saying, hey, we just loaded a new student um, and it looks as though that student came from your district, is this correct? And so in this case, you would need to select the transfers and to either approve it or decline that, um, that request. And um, likewise, if the reverse of that is true, you would then be waiting on someone to approve or decline the request from you. Um, this can be monitored in the K-Ready system in the transfer section. And um, the student data uh, that is uh, presently in the system will transfer once that transfer is completed. However, it is important to note that you can still, teachers can still collect data and enter data for a student while that transfer is pending. But the POA, the point of authority, will remain with the original district until that transfer is approved. So it's very important if you have students and you know that they're supposed to be in your district, they've transferred from another district, but the POA, the transfer is still pending, you will need to make sure that that transfer is approved, um, communicate with that district so that that can happen 
in order to uh, obtain the point of authority for that student so that that student's scores will show up in your score listing. Scores will then be transferred once that um, is approved and uh, the correct data token is assigned to the student. So it's very important. And so now you should be seeing the help desk support website. So if you come here and you click the ready for kindergarten online support system, that's going to bring us to the section. As a data manager, if you click under data manager support, we've created a help file that would walk you through these steps. The very thing that I just shared with you about transfers, all that information can be found here. Student transfers, if I click on this, it's going to bring me to a help file that walks you through the explanations that I just provided. And then also in the K-Ready system, we talked about where you could find that information on transfers. If you click transfers, here you see the requests from others. So I have um, districts that are waiting on me to approve these transfers. So I just simply click on approve. And now that student has been approved for that particular district. Here you see my requests. So these are transfers that, that I have uh, requested. And then here, you see the transfer history. So just as a reminder, um, as you're preparing to close down this window, you wanna make sure that you are checking to ensure that student scores and data are complete. And if there's any missing data that you're communicating with the teachers to get that information uh, in the system. Uh, again, we want to make sure that as a data manager, you're confirming that um, the teacher status is correct, um, whether it's active or inactive. Um, likewise, that the enrollments for a particular uh, teacher are correct and that you've used the correct data token and that ultimately you have the point of authority for those students that are part of your district, part of your system. If not, then you'll need to, again, communicate with the um, pending district to get that transfer approved so that you can uh, secure the point of authority. All right. So yes, we were gonna we're gonna go over the various reports that you can pull for the early learning assessment in the K Ready system. So let's first go and look at each one of these reports. This is the first one is the ELA SKB ratings report, and this report you can pull both during and after the collection window. So this SKB report shows all of your students in the program with all of the 72 SKBs, skills, knowledge, and behaviors that are listed. And it'll have uh, per column, we'll have all 72 and then per row will be the student. So this again, is gonna be the entire assessment. So if you're using this, if you're using this um, for the entire assessment or just for the 10 learning progressions, you'll you know, see a variation on what scores are in there and what is missing. So when you see anything missing that you know maybe should be entered, you definitely uh, wanna reach out to your teachers and, and make sure that they get those scores entered. The second report you see is the learning progression report. And this report is the final report that you give to your EMIS or EAS. Um, and this report's only available after the data collection closes. So after the window closes, which for the early learning assessment that does close on um, the last day to put any scores in is November 14th at 1159. But then data managers do have a cleanup window until November 23rd. And that's really cleaning up any transfers, any kind of student, um, student data, student demographics, things like that. So usually towards the end of November is when that learning progression report will be available. And then the last one there you see is data downloads. And this report does show all data that has been loaded for the actual current window. Um, and this would be students, teachers, enrollments. And so I, I do feel that this is one of the more helpful reports um, that data managers can take a look at and kind of see a little bit deeper. Do they have the point of authority for the student? Is student active? Um, so I want to go live and show you how to pull these reports so you know. Um, so we're going to first start as soon as you log in. Um, over on the left, select reports. 
and select your drop down arrow. So now the first two reports you see up there does say ELA reports. Those are those first two that I just went over. Um, so let's go ahead and just, I'm gonna show you first the SKB and then we'll go to the learning progression. We're gonna go really in that order that I showed the slides on here. So let's select the SKB ratings. Uh, you wanna go ahead and select your data collection. And here you have filter by POA, which is automatically checked. So when this is checked, you are only going to see students whose point of authority is with your district and which will show on this report. If you uncheck this box, you will see students that don't have necessarily um, that you're that regardless of their point of authority. So the data manager is going to see any student who has been loaded by the district. So regardless of whether that POA says yes or no. And this option is, is more or less intended for situations where students are shared by two different organizations. So we'll keep that checked. Um, show observations dates. Um, this, you would check that. And what it does is each SKB would then have an additional column next to it and it have the actual date the teacher did the observation for that item. I'm going to check that because I just want you to see it when you pull that. So we're going to do the start date of the first, um, the start date, which is August, um, I'm sorry, 15th. And the end date, we can do today's date, but then when it comes time to after the window closes, just always do November, whatever the end of that actual assessment is. So for instance, it would be November 14th. Okay, so then you want to do you select your location, um, this will provide, you know, results specifically for a specific building for those ELA students. If you select a district, this would be if you have multiple buildings um, and, and those students that have those for the ELA. If you select your region, um, this is going to provide data managers with all of their districts. So if, if data managers have multiple districts that they handle. So they want to select the generate report next. We're just going to go ahead and just do a location here and generate that report. Once that is done, you can see it is successfully requested here. And you will see it listed as SKB ELA test district. Okay, so you want to select download. And let me bring this over here for you. All right, so you can see this is going to be long. Um, so this goes all the way over, you know, column that just keeps on going. <laughs> goes all the way to, um, depending on here, so FG. So, and again, each one of these next to it does have the actual observation date. So you can see this is the actual SKB item. This is emotion identification. And all of these scores are entered for these students here. Um, this was the actual date that the observation was done. So for instance, if you're looking at this and you see there are one, two, three, four, four students that are not done, you're going to reach out to your teachers here. So you're going to reach out to Carissa. You're going to reach out to Lindsay and have them, hey, I know crunch time got to get scores entered. They have until 11.59 on November 14th. All right, so let's go ahead and let's go back. And we're going to take a look at the learning progression report. And again, the learning progression report is, um, you know, this is going to be for EMIS. This is what you do for EMIS, for EAS. Um, this report, again, cannot be done until after the window closes and after the data manager cleanup window. So really, it's more at the end of the month, and you just want to keep a lookout for it. So now currently, um, you're going to have, again, this is always automatically checked for that filter by point of authority. So you can keep it checked or you can uncheck it. You would select your data collection. Now, when this is available, these will be you know, bold. Right now they're, they're, they're grayed out because you can't pull the report. But when you do, you could select it by your district or you can select it by your region and generate that report. Um, so that's how you want to pull that particular report. 
Now, the last report I want to go through is, um, like I said earlier, is that, you know, oh, sorry, data downloads. I always forget that. I always want to say system data, but no, it's data downloads. And you're going to find it at the very bottom. And again, this is all the information that has been uploaded by your data manager. <clears throat> One of the great ones I think to pull, especially towards the end here, is going to be your enrollments. So you want to select the downloads of enrollments. You want to select your data collection. Now you can do this for Kate, the, all three of those that you see listed there. But again, we're, we're focusing on this fall ELA. So we're going to select that. And if you select your district, again, this is going to provide all your buildings within your district. If you're strictly just looking at a certain location, you can do that. So I'm just going to do location. I'm going to request that and close out of that. You can see it's been requested. And once it does, pulls up, you want to hit download. And this report is going to show you, um, just like I said, a little more info. Um, the two things that you want to you want to look at is this point of authority. Um, and whether that student's active. And again, a student becomes active once a teacher is attached. But for, for early learning students, like we've said, you know, point of authority can be, you know, shared almost by two organizations. So, you know, if you don't have that, you want to just double check. So if this, for, you know, this student here, if this actually says no, but it does say yes, double check, make sure you're good there. Make sure it is supposed to be what it is supposed to be for that particular student. Um, so you just wanna go over this at the, at the end of your, at the end of the window here, towards the end here, just making sure. And you've got some time to do any cleanups um, from the time it closes. So November 14th at 11.59 and data managers have until November 23rd to clean up any transfers, any kind of student demographic data. This next one is the reporting requirements for 2021-2022. So currently the reporting requirements for ODE and JFS licensed programs are for the ECE funded um, children and children receiving PSE services. So the PSE is the preschool special education. So PCE services to meet um, that requirement, only 10 learning progressions are needed to successfully report. EMIS and EAS, um, there are, those are the two main data warehouse systems that are used to collect this ELA data. So programs serving the, um, serving children funded by the ECE and the PSE are required to complete the early learning and report scores for the fall and spring administration window for the 2021-2022 school year. All programs may use the ELA, only ODE and ODJFS are you know, required to report for the early learning assessment. These programs must report the, the 10 required learning progressions on ECE funded children and children receiving PSE services to either EMIS and or EAS. The EMIS and EAS reporting. So you want to definitely take a look at these reporting dates. EMIS reporting dates are found in that specific EMIS manual. And again, that is listed on our additional documents. So for the fall assessment, that data is due on April 1st, 2022. And just please make note, EMIS reporting dates may change at any time. So always keep an update on that Week, bi-weekly, monthly thing, you wanna keep a look and just double checking with that. Um, EAS reporting dates and directions, they are found specifically on that link there and they must be entered um, by June 30th for the assessment completed in both the fall and spring. So that's one window time for both of those dates. Now we have um, missing student scores. You know, what to do. And the learning progression score is an N. So scores for the ELA include nine levels. Okay, so that's one, two, three, four, and five, and that's A, B, C, and D. And that represents typical milestones of a child's development. So sometimes a teacher is unable to determine a score for an SKB for a child. So when a teacher is not able to determine a score for a child on a skill, knowledge, or behavior, the teacher can enter N. A score of an N will be calculated at 
the learning progression level within the K-Ready system or on the bridge form. When submitting the assessment data to EMIS or EAS programs, they are required to enter a reason code anytime the learning progression is a score of N. So a list of allowable reason codes can be found in the EMIS manual for the assessment. Currently though, there is no column on the bridge form or in K-Ready that is available for you to enter a reason code. So we ask, again, do not alter any of these documents um, to include the reason codes. Changes to any of the bridge form or any of the reports from the K-Ready will have inaccurate data. Report, you will report inaccurate data. So as a result, the programs must develop internal communication process to talk with those teachers and, and find out exactly what the reason is, reason reporting code for an N for an item. So only one code can be reported for each learning progression, each score of N. So if multiple learning progressions are scored in N, there should be, there is needed a different reason code for each. And again, we do have in our additional resources link, we have the um, reason codes. All right, so missing learning progression scores. Um, so for each missing score, you wanna report those, those three asterisks. Report um, score not reported reason. Again, you're gonna use the reason codes. So in an event that a teacher does not have the necessary evidence to determine the rating for one or more of those SKBs, the SKB should be left blank. So a blank in the bridge form translates to a zero in EAS or EMIS report. So however, though, the zero is not a valid score. The EMIS coordinator will need to enter, like I said, those three asterisks for each learning progression that is missing a score for the ELA. When those three asterisks is reported as a test, the score not reported, the reason must also be reported. Again, must state why there is nothing there. And you'll be able to choose various valid options that best suit the situation. So reason F can only and should only be used after determining that no other reason code is appropriate. So now we'll talk a little bit about supports and just make you aware of where you can get additional information. The Ohio Department of Education's website section on early learning is a great place to start for information regarding the assessments. There you will find guidance on policy and procedure, as well as other information you know, that can assist you as an assessment data manager. And it also offers ways for you to get additional resources that you can provide for teachers and parents um, and others, administrators and others um, re regarding the assessment. So it's really important that that's a good place for you to start. It's important for you to know that that's a, a great place for you to start. Uh, from a technical perspective, the Ohio K-12 help location is um, the place you want to go if you have questions and challenges and issues specific to the system. And the help desk provides technical assistance for the K-Ready, um, as well as training and support resources. In addition to that, you know, for more answers to your questions, you can contact the help desk and uh, we'll walk you through how you would um, go through that process. But there are really two ways. Um, you can do so via email uh, or phone and the email support is provided through a form on our site. And we'll show you uh, how you can access that form. Uh, it's actually really the best way because it's a great way to document yeah, your issue or challenge. And that way we make sure we get all the information that we need and can provide you an answer. And so uh, these are two locations that we certainly want to uh, reference and make sure you are aware of. I'd like to show you now how you can go about getting an answer to your question here. And here again, I'm on the uh, help desk page. If you scroll all the way to the bottom on any of our pages, you'll see this contact support. So you also see our uh, office hours and the uh, phone number for telephone support, but you can click on request support. And once you do that, you can search for your location by name, search, and then I can find my district or my uh, institution and I can click submit. And then the form comes up and I'm able to go in and fill out that information and submit a support request. 
I showed you uh, where you could get uh, the help guide for transfers. I'd like to share that with you regarding the reports. So as she talked about those three reports, if you come to the data manager page and you look under accessing reports, you can find that information here. You see the information on accessing the SKB report. So there's a video and then steps for how to do that. So in case you missed any of that information, I wanted to make sure you were aware of where you could access that. The data downloads report. Again, there's a video, a one minute video. These are all really short. So I wanted to make sure that you were aware of where you could find that information. Just wanna to touch base on the timeline um, now. Today is November the 3rd, currently in the closed down webinar. November 14th, the window will close. So again, it's very important that all teachers understand that the student information needs to be entered by 11.59 p.m. on November the 14th for all of their students for the fall data collection window. The winter window will open on November the 15th and there's a new or different data collection token for that. So data managers need to be aware that the token for the winter uh, collection is available. It's up on the um, K Ready site as well. And so that window will open on the 5th, on November 23rd. The data cleanup ends for the fall window. And uh, again, at that point in time, um, data managers should have all of the transfers completed, the point of authorities assigned, uh, making sure that all the student scores uh, and all that data is correct and ready to go. And then sometime in early December, the fall reports should be ready. So you should receive um, access or uh, information on how you can access the learning progression reports so that that information could then be submitted to EMIS. I want to take a moment to see if there are any questions. Um, there was a question about how you are able to sort and find transfers. So let me just take a moment and share that with you as well. So we'll go back to this. So I'm here in the transfers area. And the question that the person asked was really specific to how do I sort for my transfers? So if I go into transfers and I try to sort, right now this is sorting by the months um, and not necessarily um, drilling down to you know, the most recent or something of that nature. So I know that, um, the, and again, this is an example, this is uh, on our data manager sample page. So uh, I don't have any current transfers, but I know that I did some transfers, a, a transfer in 2020. So if I don't wanna see what I did back in 2018 or 2017, and I only wanna see what I did in 2020, if I enter that information in the search field, it will filter out and just show me the transfers in 2020. So for instance, for fall of 21, just enter 2021 and only the, the transfers that you have in your history for this year should show up. You can even sort by month. So if I do 05, 2020, yep. So I can sort um, and get, um, information that way as well. So also I do have one other person asking, you know, can you go over the bulk transfer, especially when it comes to, um, you know, bulk letting a student, what it does in triggering the transfer request. When a student is added. So let's say I have um, a, a district, we'll call it district A, and a student is um, uh, coming from district B. When I, as the data manager, load that student from District B, I enter that student's student ID information into the K-Ready system, it's going to trigger a transfer because that student has actually already been loaded at, at District B. It's going to send a message, a transfer request to District B saying, hey, District A is um, loading the student. They are requesting that essentially you give the student to them. And at that point, the data manager at District B should then be able to go in and approve that, that transfer request. Oh, yes, that's correct. That student has left our district and is at a different location now, and it's okay for us to approve. It's okay for us to give permission for that district, District A, to have that student. So that's what we meant when we said when a student's loaded into the K-Ready system in the bulk loader, it will trigger a transfer when that student ID is used in a different district. Uh, yeah, I was just going to respond to the NE and N scores that was in the chat because I 
feel like it's a little bit longer of an explanation than it is to, to type it. So um, the way K-Ready works is the K-Ready system has the score of N and ME. If a child is on an IEP um, and is cannot access the item, so let's say um, Olivia is in a wheelchair and so it wouldn't be expected that she would be able to demonstrate locomotor skills, you would use the score N. It's similar to a not scorable um, because they don't have access to it. If it's an NE, that means not yet evident. And that means that the child has not um, gone, has not reached the level of the first um, descriptor. So like, let's say on the scale or rubric A through D levels one through five, let's say that between levels one through five, they haven't met that indicator, that level descriptor yet, you would put not yet evident, meaning it's coming soon, it's not there yet. If you have not assessed a child, you would leave it that score blank. So there's three different ways. There's N, N, E, and blank. Um, when you're using the bridge form, we just have one letter for all three of those categories, and that is the N. So I hope that that makes sense. So if you're seeing some NEs, that just means um, on the in K ready, it means not yet coming. It's not yet evident, but it is. It will progress eventually. You're going to translate that to an N on the bridge form, as well as a not scorable. That is because uh, due to a um, disability or special need, and so that would be um, when you would use the the end. And then I feel like the last one blank, I'm sorry, I'm getting a um, text message to answer it. Leave blank in the bridge form if it's not assessed. So if it's not assessed, you would leave it blank. And then I think it automatically gives it an end. Either way, if the score for the item is N or NE in K ready or N because it's not accessible or not yet evident and you're using the bridge form. So the teacher selects N or the item was not assessed at all, you don't have evidence to support a rating at all, you leave the item blank, the output for the learning progression is N in, that, in any of those cases. If a student has chronic absences and the assessment is incomplete, no, do not, and do not use the N rating unless the teacher has made an effort to implement something in the classroom that would give a child an opportunity to demonstrate a skill, knowledge, or behavior, but maybe, or, or they're working with their IEP and they know that these certain skills are not accessible to the child. So I'm going to rate that item N not scorable. Or for some of the number sense items, you'll notice if you're looking at the rubric with the performance level descriptors, there are no descriptors for A through D or one. Some of them start later. And so in that case, the teacher could use NE, not yet evident. But the NE is only an option in the K-Ready system. If you're using the bridge form, the Excel document, there's only an N. And in that case, it really means the same thing because regardless, the output for the learning progression is going to be an N. But a blank means that there was no time or no, maybe you, the child was only there for a few days so you didn't get to cover everything. So you just leave those items blank. But still the output is going to be an N. And that's why you have the reason codes that you would use when you report that star, star, star. So if, it's, if, you, have a, if you have an N learning progression rating, it means one or more SKB in that learning progression either has a blank or an N or an NE. And then yes, you need to enter star, star, star and a reason code for that N learning progression score. Um, they state I have made the students in active, uh, inactive and have not received any transfer requests yet for those students and stating that their transfer requests are blank. So on that, you've done everything correct. If a student has left your district, you need to make that student inactive by removing the teacher. So that way that student will not show on any reports. Um, it is up to the new district, new school, 
to do a transfer. So if you have not heard from them, they have not loaded those student have not loaded that student yet. Um, so they are in charge of triggering that transfer request for that student. And it's important that on your end that you um, make that student inactive and disassociate that student with the teacher on your end. Uh, and again, if you have questions, uh, reach out. If there are policy questions, certainly reach out to the department. And if you have technical questions, reach out to the help desk. And we're all here to help you and happy to do so. I'd like to thank all of you for your time today. Um, we look forward to, to helping you and, and being here for you to support you. Thank you and have a wonderful day.